Paul asked me to say something personal to start with, rather than just go into the science. Uh, my wife also says the same thing. She said, go personal, tell them who you are. And uh, I'm not very good at that. I'm a scientist. I'm just a regular scientist. Um, but a question I ask, a question I hear often is like, when did you, wh why are you doing this? And my answer is, well, I, I became organic um, five, six, seven years ago. I married for the second time nine years ago and bought a little farm on the tiny little farm. I call it a farm, but it's really a big market garden um, on the Vancouver Island. And one day I was reading on the net, on the internet, some document that made sense. It was written in scientific language that I could read. And it said that fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers are damaging the soil, damaging the life of the soil. And I go, uh, I didn't know that. I didn't learn that in graduate school. So I was intrigued. So I went to take a three-day course with the woman who had actually written the document that I could read because, you know, if you tell me that organic is better for you, or organic is more nutritious, I say, show me the data. And that's when I converted. And I think it's because I became organic, that I was more exposed to read more widely. And, and over the last five to seven years, I've read a lot of studies, scientific studies, published studies, that basically say that there's serious problems with this technology. When I was in the field, the paradigm was this is great technology. We are God. We can do wonderful things. We're going to do absolutely beautiful, wonderful things for agriculture. This was a green technology, and I did not uh, argue or question that, like all my colleagues. It was understood that that was the paradigm at the time, the dogma. And I have basically changed my position. And so tonight, what I'm going to give you is some disturbing. Uh, some of you may know of it already. Some of you will be surprised. Some of you will be shocked, and some of you will be angry. I call it the gene revolution because it is a revolution. It's happened in the last 20 years. The first commercial um, crops, genetically engineered crops, were commercialized in 1996. 1992 was the flavor severed tomato, but that was a, a bust. It didn't work. But 1996 was when Monsanto had corn and soy engineered to tolerate herbicide. I also, okay. Another little introduction. I want to tell you that here in North America, we live in a bubble. We live in a bubble of information that is given to us by the chemical companies, the biotech industry, that basically tells us that everything is very safe and very okay, very cool. But the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world doesn't work to that tune. Most of the rest of the world, 64 countries today, are regulating, banning, labeling GMOs because they have seen enough scientific evidence, which I'm going to tell, show you tonight. And they have said, not for us, thank you very much. But here in North America, we don't seem to, to sing to that tune. We are in a bubble. I call, us, I call it the gene revolution, but it's really a tale of two molecules. The tiny little one, we've, you're familiar with the double helix, of course, so that's DNA, that's one of the molecules. The other one is uh, the, um, it's called glycine phosphonate. Glycine phosphonate is um, the active ingredient in Roundup. And I'm going to talk about Roundup because it deserves a piece of my talk just by itself. This is what I'm going to cover tonight. I'm going to talk about Roundup, then I'm go we're going to go quickly about you know, what GMOs are and how they're made, because most people are really curious, and what do they deliver? Because the industry is very clear that GMOs are decreasing pesticide use and increasing yield and completely innocuous to the environment and, of course, perfectly safe to eat. So, Roundup. Roundup is that little tiny molecule, glycine phosphonate, which was uh, shortened to glyphosate. It, glycine is an amino acid. 
very common. Phosphonate is a small molecule like phosphoric acid, and you make um, uh, a salt of glycine with the phosph phosphonic acid, and you get glycine phosphonate. Now, most of the salts of phosphonic acids are chelating agent. A chelator is a molecule that grabs onto metal ions. And that's what this molecule was invented for in 1967. 1967, this molecule was invented, patented as a chelating agent. Very powerful chelating agent, very broad spectrum, very strong. It grabs onto many different kinds of metals. That's what this molecule does. Because it, grow, it grabs onto a lot of metals, it has the ability to compete with basically any living organism. So very quickly it was discovered that it was a very broad spectrum herbicide. And so of course it was patented as a herbicide. And then Monsanto bought the patent and acquired the molecule, so to speak. And it didn't take very long after that also to realize that it was antibiotic and it was patented as an antibiotic. A chelating agent grabs onto metal ions, and you're probably, some of you have biology background, I'm sure, but most of you know that you need to have iron in your blood. And the iron in your blood is the metal ion that a protein in your blood needs badly to do its work. If it doesn't have that iron, it cannot do its work. You all know, of course, that it's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein. It needs a metal ion. It needs iron, iron to work. Many, many of our proteins, many of our enzymes need a metal ion. It could be cobalt, it could be manganese, it could be all kinds of things which this molecule is competing for. And so if you have this molecule in your body, it will compete for ions, for metal ions that your proteins are hungry for, that your enzymatic activity are hungry for. There is no doubt that this gene revolution has taken agriculture by surprise, or it has completely taken over agriculture today. Most of the big crops are engineered. You can think of, of course, you know canola here, but you could think of wheat. We don't have wheat, engineered wheat in Canada yet, but it's coming. Sugar beet, sugar beet came a few years ago, and uh, today 100% of sugar beets are engineered. Um, corn, of course, soya, big crops, 90 plus percent of those crops are engineered. And all those crops are engineered to resist the herbicide. This is what genetic engineering means today. It's to resist the Roundup herbicide. These crops are Roundup ready. So when you hear that um, uh, there's golden rice coming and it will save the world, or there's papaya, uh, or there is other crops, these are distractions. 90 plus percent of all engineered, and we're talking hundreds of millions of acres on the planet today, are engineered to resist this molecule, this Roundup herbicide. This is what, this is what GMOs are today. And I'm going to show you, during my talk, you will have to remember this, I'm going to show you a lot of references, scientific references. For example, this one is an article that was published in Soil Biology and Biochemistry. This is a scientific journal. It's published in public knowledge. The Roundup, when it's applied, because obviously the technology works only if the uh, herbicide is applied, the Roundup, when it's applied, because it is antibiotic, has all kinds of secondary effects on life forms everywhere in the agricultural fields and in the environment everywhere that really were not planned for. But this is what we have today. There's definitely a lot of evidence that 
the nitrogen fixing bacteria, this is a, um, a root uh, system of soybean. There are nodules of bacteria, rhizobium bacteria, that fix the nitrogen from the air and they are not working as well because of the antibiotic that is applied. Oops, something is missing there, but anyway, there's references here, there should be references on the screen showing you that fish are also affected. We've known for over 20 years that the frogs are badly, badly affected. This uh, Roundup is antibiotic, but it, in this particular case with the frog, it's also very much teratogenic, it causes birth defects. This frog has an extra leg. And it's more recently that we are becoming aware of the antibiotic effect on the bacteria and there's definitely uh, effects on bacteria that are normally um, in the body associated with, in symbiosis with, a lot of organisms including the birds and the mammals. This, uh, this study was done with uh, poultry and it was shown that Salmonella and Botulinum uh, bacteria are actually resistant to the herbicide, to the antibiotic. But the beneficial bacteria in the guts of the, of the, um, of the birds are not resistant. And here is a, there's a lot of studies that have been done with mice and rats. And this particular study uh, was to uh, see if there was any effect on the intestinal and liver activity of the rats. And what was found was there's a particular family of enzymes that are extremely important and they are, they are um, everywhere. They are called cytochrome P450 cytochrome P450. Glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, inhibits cytochrome P450 enzymes, a whole family of enzymes. And this has incredible um, consequences. The consequences of just inhibiting this family of enzymes, the prediction is that it is going to cause gastrointestinal disorders and, you know, it's not like you're going to have a tummy ache. We're talking Crohn's disease, we're talking celiac, we're talking leaky guts, that kind of gastrointestinal disorders. There's also kidney and liver damage, infertility, cancer, breast cancer mostly. And there is a report, it was not a, a study, it was a report, it was just a couple of scientists who looked, they looked into, they did a literature review and, and found hundreds of papers that had been published on what cytochrome P450 family of enzyme does and if you inhibit these enzymes, what could happen in the body of people, humans? And found that, yes, you would get also gastrointestinal disorders, you would get kidney and liver damage, you would get infertility problems, and you would get cancer, but you will also get obesity, you would, you would get depression, autism, and Alzheimer. Just because some enzymes that are affecting very essential um, processes in the cells. These symptoms, all, of, all the first symptoms have been shown in mice and rats and the other one, the bottom ones, are predicted for humans. The herbicide, we're still with Roundup, the herbicide um, has been, uh, when I was in graduate school 40 years ago, this herbicide was relatively new and it was the best thing since sliced bread. It was incredibly non-toxic. It was actually uh, shown to be less toxic than aspirin. 
absolutely no toxicity. It has no acute toxicity, or very little. And I think that's all the information that was needed. It didn't affect anything else. It didn't affect animals because it's supposed to work on the plants in a certain way. It inhibits the shikimat pathway or, or another family of enzymes. And shikimat pathway does not exist in animals. Therefore, animals, mammals, birds, amphibians, all the animals were spared. There would be absolutely no effect on them. What was not thought of at the time is that bacteria have the shikimat pathway. Now, some of you may know, and most of you probably don't, that you have bacteria in your intestine. And the bacteria in your intestine are not just sort of, a, you know, bacteria on your skin or just, they are incredibly important to your health. You and I are a symbiotic organism. You have in your guts a hundred trillion bacteria. One hundred trillion. Can you imagine? So, these bacteria in your guts are mostly responsible for your immune system. They are mostly responsible for your mental health because they produce 90% of the serotonin that goes into your brain and many other neurotransmitters. They're responsible for vitamins, they're responsible for all kinds of services. We call them services, but think of it as being a symbiotic. You think you're human, but only 1% of your DNA is human. 99% of your DNA in your body is bacterial DNA. 10% of your cells are human cells. 90% of your cells are bacterial cells. That's how important the symbiosis is. Now, Roundup glyphosate is a good herbicide, but if it is an antibiotic, if it is a chelating agent, it's very good as a chelating agent, but really, do we want it in our food and affect our gut bacteria? The comment from the biotech, from the chemical industry, which has morphed into the biotech industry, the comments from the chemical industry is that there is absolutely zero evidence that Roundup or GMOs have harmed anybody ever. And there are like a trillion meals have been served and nobody has ever died from it. And that's a very interesting statement because they have absolutely nothing to back up, to back it up. There's absolutely no scientific studies whatsoever to back up this statement. What we have on the other hand is a lot of correlation studies, not causation studies. This is not the kind of studies where you feed kids Roundup or people Roundup and then you watch what's going on. No, there's no such studies. But what we have is a lot of correlations which link the diseases that I showed you on the right side to the use of Roundup to residues of Roundup in our food. So, for example, I hope everybody can read this. This says, children diagnosed with celiac disease, celiac, gastrointestinal disorders. And the funny thing is, is it starts, the, 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 the curve starts climbing up about in the mid-1990s, 1996, 1997, when Roundup started to be used on engineered crops. And I could show you curves exactly like that for kidney disease, liver disease. This, is, this one is for number of hospital, hospitalizations for acute kidney injury plotted against glyphosate applied on corn and soy. And you can see that from 1996 
which is when the curve starts going up. And there is the same kind of curve for celiac, Crohn's disease, leaky guts, uh, kidney injury, liver injury, thyroid cancer, all kinds of cancer, um, and all sorts of things. And some people in the industry are very quick to say, this is not valid, these are correlation studies, you could correlate these curves with uh, the number of Toyota cars on the street. And it's true. It's just an, inter an interesting coincidence. That's what I have to say about Roundup. Because every time you eat something that is engineered, it was sprayed with Roundup, and it has fairly high residues of the antibiotic, of the herbicide. So you have to assume, because 90%, 90 plus percent of corn and soy and canola oil and canola and cotton seed, uh, cotton and et cetera, et cetera, are engineered, you have to assume that most of the food in the store, in the grocery stores, that are prepared, that are baked, that are canned, that are processed, contain engineered um, ingredients with the Roundup residues. Okay, now I'm going to talk about genetic engineering. What are GMOs? Well, I've said it already, but I'll repeat it. GMOs are Roundup ready. That's it. Over 90% of all engineered plants on the planet are Roundup ready. It's an incredible success for the chemical industry, for that particular corporation that sells the herbicide. It's amazing. It's a great deal of money. HT stands for herbicide tolerance. That's the trait that is engineered into the plant. And there is, so of course, I've said it already, but it's corn, canola, soy, etc., etc. There is another trait which you may have heard of. It's called BT. And BT stands for the name of, complicated name of a bacteria. It's called Bacillus thuringiensis. And Bacillus thuringiensis was discovered about 100 years ago in Japan. The Japanese industry makes silk, and the silkworm were dying in Japan. They were having a really serious problem with their silkworm industry because the silkworm were dying. And nobody could find out why. They invited several biologists from Europe to come and investigate, and a German biologist discovered that it was a bacteria that had contaminated the silkworm industry and that was killing the worms. And that bacteria has the characteristic of when it sporulates, when living conditions are not good anymore, when there's not enough water or it's too hot or too cold or too dry, it sporulates, it just shrinks to a little spore. And as it makes a little spore, it also makes a protein crystal. It makes a crystal protein. And it's almost like a hook. It's a survival mechanism because that crystal protein is incredibly toxic to all caterpillars and many other insects. When the bacteria is on plants, it's very common, it's in nature, it's on the plant and conditions are right, it sporulates and makes that crystal protein and an insect comes and chewing on the plant, absorb, ingest that crystal protein, the protein will make leaky guts. It will just basically make holes in the um, digestive system of the insect and kill the, and kill the insects. BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a bacteria, okay, discovered a hundred years ago, and then it was forgotten about, and then sometime not too long after World War II, somebody thought, like, oh, this bacteria kills caterpillars, and we have caterpillar problem, caterpillar pests in agriculture and in forestry, 
why don't we, can we grow these bacteria in big fermenters and spread it, spray it, and see, we, and it works. And this bacteria was actually used, or is still in use in many places, as an organic pesticide. It's a natural bacteria. It exists in nature, all around us. Nothing more natural. Knowing this, if you are a genetic engineer, it would be very smart if you would isolate, find the gene that makes the protein, the crystal protein. You find the gene that makes that crystal protein, and you could engineer that gene into a plant, and the whole plant is now producing the crystal protein, and it's completely immune to the caterpillars. As soon as the caterpillar chews on the leaf, well, game over. And this is what, this is what the, engine, the genetic engineers did. So it's called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's the second trait. But if 90%, over 90% of all the engineered plants are engineered to resist the herbicide, BT is a very small minority of that. It's 10 to 20%. So that's what GMOs are. How are they created? Well, there's basically two ways. The first most important part, the first most important way, is to use a gene gun. A gene gun is, it looks like a hair dryer. It's a gun, and what it does is that it works with um, compressed CO2, and you are shooting in plant cells, you're shooting little tiny microscopic pellets of titanium or gold, something that will not oxidize, that you have covered with the transgene, with the um, gene construct that you want, the genes that you want to insert into the plant. So you coat your pellet, you put that into your gene gun, and then you shoot. And then you, using enzymes, you can um, make single cells from the tissue that you shot with the gene gun, and you can find which cells have been engineered, which cells have taken the gene construct that you had, and somehow the gene construct found its way into the nucleus of the cell and was integrated in one of the chromosomes of the plant cell. Gene gun technology. It's incredibly inefficient, but if you shoot enough millions of pellets, you do get engineered cells. You will need to find out which ones were engineered and which ones were not, because you have on your petri dishes, you have like millions and millions of cells and which ones are engineers and which ones are not. So you need a process to actually find out the events, the, the, the successful events. And until now, the way to do that is to use a marker gene and the mark, so you have the gene that you like, the BT gene or the gene for resistance to the herbicide, and next to that you put a marker gene. And the marker gene that has been used, because it's very convenient, so far have been antibiotic resistance genes. You have all heard about antibiotic resistance in bacteria. It's a problem in the medical field. And it's quite com the, the, those bacteria are quite common. You can find the gene that, cause, that is responsible for the antibiotic resistance. You can put it next to the gene that you want to shoot into the plant. And then when you plate all your single cells, you put a little antibiotic in the medium, and the antibiotic will kill the plant cells. And the ones that will survive have the antibiotic resistance gene and, most importantly, the gene that you want, the Roundup resistance or the Bt gene. Antibiotic resistance. I'm telling you this because I'm going to come back to that. So that's the gene gun technology. There's another way 
and it works with some plants but not a lot, it's to use a bacteria. There is a bacteria that has learned to transfer its genes or some of its genes to plants. It's the original genetic engineer and it's also common in nature. It's nothing more natural than that. It's called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. You don't need to remember that. Bacteria transfer their genes to each other. If you don't know this, but the, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, a quick story here since I have a lot of time. Uh, Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. It took time to cool down, for the water to, to, to condensate, lots of water on the Earth. And then the molecules start playing with each other and getting bigger and forming amino acids and etc. nucleic acid and stuff. And then you get the first cell, which we would call a bacteria today, but the original ancestor of the bacteria. And then they multiplied and they basically colonized the planet. And that's all there was on the planet for two billion years. Bacteria, nothing else. And they, during that time, they evolved all the enzymes that we know of today. They evolved all the mechanisms. They invented photosynthesis long before the plants. They invented all kinds of things. They invented hemoglobin, etc. And then they decided to invent the bigger organisms. They evolved into the eukaryotic cells with a nucleus, which became the fungi, the plants, and the animals. The bacteria are our ancestors. And the bacteria do something that we cannot do anymore. We, the eukaryotic cells lost that ability. The bacteria can exchange genes with each other. And the genes code for proteins, you know that. But a protein is a tool, a protein is an enzyme. A protein can, it's like, it's like imagine that you have a big shop and wall, uh, on, on, on the wall of your shop you have tools. Well, this is what the proteins are, they are enzymes, they do things in your cell. And then suddenly there's a bacteria that invented a new tool. Well, look at me, I've got this new tool. Hey, would you like, would you like some? Here, come close and will share. And they share. It's called lateral gene transfer. It's as if you were able to do that. You just sit next to the person next to you and say, would you like some of my genes? And when they invented the bigger cells, the eukaryotic cells, well, the eukaryotic cells reproduce, or the eukaryotic cells exchange genes with a completely different mechanism. It's called sex. You give, you receive, your genes from your parents and you give them to your kids is vertical transfer. It's got nothing to do with lateral gene transfer. The bacteria can actually give genes to each other, but we don't, only with sex. Usually when I say sex, there's always a woman in the audience that goes like, yay, yay. <laughs> At least I think they're a woman. <laughs> so these bacteria, and I'm going to take a few minutes here because it's kind of a, it's a love story, okay? This bacteria comes to the plant, the plant is not able, the plant can only do sex. But the bacteria doesn't know that and the plant swims in the soil, this is a normal common bacteria in the soil, and it swims to the roots and it finds, it comes to a plant cell. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going too fast here. Uh, biology 101. This is a bacteria on the left, a bacterial cell. It has a chromosome and it has little tiny chromosomes, a whole collection of little tiny chromosomes which are really usually circular called plasmids. And the bacteria has on one of these plasmids, don't look at the details, uh, the, the, the bacteria on one of its plasmids, it's called a TI plasmid, a tumor inducing plasmid, it has everything it needs to transfer its genes to the plant cell. Because really, the bacteria doesn't even know that it's dealing with a plant cell. It thinks it's dealing with another bacteria. It just wants to exchange genes with another bacteria. But it's really a plant cell. And so, 
The bacteria swims to the plant, the plant is constantly saying, I'm a plant, I'm a plant, just like you and me, doing pheromone, you know, we, hey, I'm a human being, I'm a, I'm a male, I'm a female, etc. And so the bacteria comes to the plant and it says, would you like to get married? And when it's right next to the plant, there is a bio, they're talking to each other constantly. And there is biochemistry involved and the TI plasmid, the plasmid that contains the DNA that will be transferred, and it also contains a region called the VIR region, V-I-R, and V-I-R stands for virulence. And those virulence, the virulence regions, is a, a, a big piece of DNA which codes for all the proteins that are necessary, the tools that are necessary to do all that transfer, because it's very complicated. And the virulence proteins will actually make a copy of the DNA, of the tDNA, the transfer DNA, a DNA that will move into the plant cell, make a copy of that, and then it takes the copy of the DNA. You have to picture, imagine this room as a, being a cell. Well, you know, things don't just swim about. They are actually going from this door to that door because there is a tool, there's a protein that goes, okay, you're coming with me. And the proteins actually are pulling the piece of DNA across the whole bacterial cytoplasm and across the cytoplasm membrane and across the plant membrane and into the cytoplasm of the plant cell and into the nucleus. And different proteins do different jobs. And then the last one just cut and paste that DNA into a chromosome of the plant cell. The VIR proteins take the DNA into the nucleus. And once the tDNA, the transferred DNA, is integrated into a chromosome of the plant cell, it can function. And that DNA, bacterial DNA, is taking over the machinery of the plant cell so that the plant cell is now making something that does not exist in the plant kingdom. It's making food for the bacteria. If you are a genetic engineer and you've studied all that, because it took quite a few years to study all that and to understand how it works, well, you can, you have the tools, the proteins, to cut the tDNA out of the bacteria and replace that DNA with the DNA of your choice. It could be the gene for Roundup resistance or the Bt gene, and you put that into the bacteria and the bacteria doesn't feel a thing, it doesn't know it happened. And then you take the bacteria and you put it next to a plant cell, and the bacteria will do what it does. It will transfer the tDNA, your tDNA, and it will transfer it into a chromosome of the plant cell. The plant cell is now engineered with the DNA of your choice. All you have to do now is reasonably complicated, but it's graduate student stuff. You can regenerate a whole plant out of one single cell. You can think of it as an embryonic cell, a stem cell, whatever. And you get a whole plant, and each cell of that plant contains in its nucleus the tDNA of your choice. If it was Bt, each cell of the plant is now con has the Bt gene and it's turned on because you have added to it a piece of DNA, a viral piece of DNA from a virus that tells the gene to be turned on all the time. And so 24-7, every cell of this plant is now making the Bt protein. And when you have hundreds a hundred million acres of plants that are Bt plants, then every plant is making the Bt protein, which is a pesticide. And those plants are actually registered in Canada and in the USA as a pesticide. Not as a plant, as a pesticide. So I'm going to review 
the claims of the chemical, the biotech industry. The biotech industry is telling us that GMOs reduce the use of pesticide. But the biotech industry is really the chemical industry, and that's a very strange financial uh, goal for the chemical industry to want to reduce the sale of chemicals, because that's what they do. That's their living. And of course, that is not at all what has happened. The sales of, well, Roundup has been very successful. Uh, like I said, there's several hundred million acres sprayed with Roundup today. But not just that. It's that the farmers, the growers, knowing that the plants that they have sold, that they have planted, are resistant. Maybe I'll take a minute to explain to you how it grows, because probably not everybody here is a farmer. Roundup herbicide is an incredibly broad spectrum herbicide. Basically, it kills all plants. So if you spray Roundup on your field, you're going to kill everything, including your crops. So imagine that a chemical company comes with this magic herbicide, and it will work in your garden, it will work in your field. You just don't care about your weeds anymore. Don't think about your weeds. It doesn't matter. You don't need to think about your weeds. Just plant your crops and just spray the herbicide and all your weeds disappear. Uh, some of you may be gardeners. I am a gardener. I can tell you that the weeds are a serious problem. I wish they were not there. And if there was such a thing as something that I could spray that would be completely safe, that would make all the weeds disappear, I would do it. The Roundup herbicide sales have increased, they've gone through the roof in the last 10, 15 years. And this is what the curve is showing you. This goes on to 2007 and we're in 2013 and it's going even more exponentially. 600 million pounds of extra herbicide. Million pounds of extra herbicide. But something has happened, something that was predicted, predictable and predicted at the time when the crops were commercialized in 1996. A lot of scientists predicted that the, um, there would be weeds that would adapt and that would evolve to resist the herbicide. And it has happened. Today, half of the acreage in the USA is infested with many, many different species of weeds. There's up to 40 of them, 40 different species of weeds, of invasive weeds. Some of them are incredibly invasive and a serious problem for the growers. And there are in Ontario, in Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and not that I know of, we don't have them in BC yet, and they're coming. I don't know if it will be this year or next year, but they will be here. This is biology, it's normal, it's predictable. We don't have Roundup resistant weeds today, but they will be here soon. So this is Roundup, of course, because as the weeds become resistant, the growers have to spray more. Well, you've got, you know, you've sprayed, and well, there's some weeds that were not killed, so you come and you spray again, maybe with a higher rate, and you kill them. But next year, they're more resistant. So you spray again and more, and you spray more and more, and that explains, as I said, the uh, volume of herbicide that has gone through the roof. But because the industry knew very well that this was going to happen, they have had many, many years to prepare for it. And so now we have the next generation, we have the next technology, we have crops resistant to another herbicide. And the growers won't even need to know what happened. They'll just have the same system. They'll be spraying a different chemical, that's all. 
And that new chemical is 2,4-D. 2,4-D is what was sprayed in Vietnam. Agent Orange. Except at the time the uh, manufacturing was a little more sloppy than it is today, so the Agent Orange was badly contaminated with dioxin, which are teratogenic. Hopefully, um, we won't have dioxins in the 2,4-D today. But 2,4-D is not necessarily safe. There's quite a few studies that show that it's actually uh, dangerous. It's definitely linked to Parkinson's disease. If you are exposed to 2,4-D uh, routinely, you will get Parkinson's disease. This is known, published, public knowledge. And what about the blonde, you say? Well, this is, this is what the farmers are seeing today. This is the advertisement from the chemical companies to induce the farmers into uh, adopting the new technology and ignoring the risks on their own health and the health of everybody. GMO increased yield. Well, there's absolutely no reason why GMOs would increase yield other than perhaps good weed control. Yes, if you get good weed control compared to a terribly weedy field, you get a better yield. But if you get, if you compare, you know, fields without um, uh, weeds, uh, whether it's with Roundup or not, then there's definitely no increase in yield. Actually, there is a decrease in yield in most uh, in instances. This is a very recent uh, uh, study done by, uh, to compare the yields of corn in Europe from over the last 20 years to the yields of corn in North America. And the yields of corn in Europe were slightly lower 20 years ago than in North America, and today they are actually higher than in North America. And this is like on average for the whole continent. They do not use the technology in Europe, and they have better yields. The technology does not increase yield. This is part of the bubble that I mentioned. And there is a document called Failure to Yield using uh, data, statistics from the USDA, showing that in the USA, uh, there is definitely no increase in yield. There is also studies that were done early on because they would not be done today because the chemical companies would not allow it that showed they were done in Kansas State University, Iowa State University and Illinois I think showing that actually there is what they call a yield drag. The engineering process actually slows down the yields of the plants 5% or more. A yield drag. There is no increase in yield. And the chemical industry uh, says it abundantly, there is absolutely no effect on the environment. You remember what I said about Roundup? Roundup and engineered crops come together. So there is definitely an effect of Roundup on the environment, but even the engineering, pro the engineering cro engineered crops themselves have an effect on the environment. And the first one is contamination. Contamination of the environment means that if you are organic or conventional growers or farmers and I have a field of engineered canola next to you, your canola, the pollen from my field will be in yours. Or, and it will work with corn and every other crop as well. Contamination which means that if, like in Canada, we used to have a market exporting canola and flax to the European Union, well, we've lost that because of contamination. Hundreds of millions of dollars of export lost because of contamination. We have now alfalfa, and the organic growers and the uh, people growing uh, beef are extremely upset because they don't want engineered alfalfa next to them. 
contamination with canola, contamination with flux. And then there's another problem, which is probably the most serious problem of all. More than Roundup, more than contamination, more than everything else. It's what I call genetic pollution. And genetic pollution is this. The genes that are engineered into the plants are from bacteria. They're called bacterial transgenes. Transgene, the genes are transferred into the bacteria. And those bacterial genes, remember what bacteria do? They just give it to their neighbors. Well, the bacteria are perfectly capable of picking up the genes, the bacterial genes, from the transgenic plants into the soil. So now you have bacteria into the soil that have the gene, the bacterial genes that were transferred into the genetically engineered plants. Remember what I said about antibiotic resistance? The bacteria are perfectly capable of picking up those genes. And you remember you have bacteria in your guts? Human volunteers, this is uh, 10 years old or more, uh, human volunteers were given a meal of soybean, engineered soybean, and then their guts, I don't know how, were uh, looked at to see if the DNA had been digested. No, it had not been all digested, and there were pieces of DNA in their guts, and there were pieces of DNA in their guts with the bacterial transgenes, and those bacterial transgenes were picked up by the bacteria of the guts of these human volunteers. Genetic pollution. This is a study that was published a year ago in China. The Chinese scientists looked for antibiotic-resistant bacteria into the rivers in China a number of rivers. And they found antibiotic resistant bacteria into every river they sampled. And the antibiotic resistance genes in those bacteria were synthetic genes. They were genes that came from a lab. They were genes that came highly probably from the local transgenic crops that found, and the antibiotic resistance genes found their way into the rivers. GMOs are safe to eat. GMOs are perfectly safe to eat. Nobody has ever been affected by eating engineered food. When the engineered crops, how am I doing for time? Okay. When the engineered crops were commercialized in 1996, the government in the USA and the Food and Drug Administration that were responsible for um, registering for registering the crops came up with um, the concept of substantial equivalence. Now, substantial equivalence means that an engineered plant, corn looks like corn, it tastes like corn, it grows like corn, it must be the same as corn. Yes, it does contain a new protein, which is not normal in corn, but it looks like corn. And so it is equivalent. It is substantially equivalent. Therefore, we really don't need to test it. And this is the concept of substantial equivalence. And so, absolutely no testing has been done on these engineered crops by the regulatory agencies. The only testing that have been done have been done by the chemical companies and the scientists uh, that um, uh, are paid by the chemical companies to do that. And the, their result say that the engineered food are perfectly safe. That's the bubble. 
But like I said, the rest of the world does not sing to that tune and the rest of the world goes by another set of data that has been accumulating in the last 15 years because a lot of scientific studies have been done, a lot of them in Europe and Japan and Korea and India and Russia and other countries and they find quite different results. The concept of substantial equivalence is based on the fact that the engineered plant is making a new protein. And that new protein, we know what it is, and we have looked at it, and we have tested it on mice and rats, and it is innocuous, and therefore it is equivalent. But I need to explain to you that when you shoot pellets, into the plant cell and one pellet finds its way in the nucleus and the bacterial transgene construct with the viral genes promoter goes into, uh, is integrated into the nucleus of a plant. There's no, no relationship. This is a bacteria and a plant. This is not a bacteria and another bacteria. This is a bacteria and a very different organism. And basically, the genes that have been transferred goes like, where the hell are we? And what are we supposed to do here? And what they do is basically, they are now under the control of the plant genome. And the plant genome, like all genomes, and this is something we've learned in the last 20 years, a genome is an incredibly sophisticated and sensitive ecosystem. When I was in graduate school, there was about 5% of the genome that was coding for protein, that were genes coding for proteins, and the rest, the 95%, we absolutely don't have a clue as to what it could do, it's junk DNA. We have 95% of our genome is junk, and it's only in the last 10 to 20 years that we've learned that actually it's not junk at all. It's incredibly sophisticated system of feedback and, 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 and forward processes that regulates in real time, that allows us to live and to adapt. Those bacterial transgenes are now in the plants, under the control of the plant, genes around them, and they don't always do what we think they should be doing. What we do, the genetic engineering technology is based on the concept of one gene, one protein, that's from Watson and Crick 50, 60 years ago, and now we know since the end of the genome project, the human genome project, that there's no such thing, and that a lot of genes actually work together to make a protein today, tomorrow is a different protein, etc., because they, they collaborate, they work together. But this is so complex and so complicated, we really don't know how it works. Genetic engineering is very invasive in the plant cell, in the genome of the plant, and basically, instead of getting one protein, the protein we expect, what we get is many different kinds of protein. Many of them don't look at all like what they should be. They're truncated, they are deformed, and we don't know what they could do. Because remember, proteins are tools, proteins are enzymes, and they have an enzymatic activity. And we have, basically, by doing this, Invasive technology, we have changed the proteins that uh, are produced. There is many research studies that show that many proteins are produced when there should be only one. Many variable proteins where there should be only one. In 1996, the expert toxicologist of the Food and Drug Administration in the USA warned their director to expect that, to expect that genetic engineering would produce variable protein, rogue proteins, different proteins, truncated proteins, and we really 
don't know what could happen, and some of them could be expected to be toxic or allergenic or cause nutrient deficiencies or all kinds of other problems. The director had been a lawyer for Monsanto. He was now the director of the Food and Drug Administration. He did not listen to them. He said, no problem. These crops are okay. They're commercialized. And then he became a vice president for Monsanto. This is public knowledge. This is published in the journal Biotechnology in 2004. They predicted allergies, and we see allergies in mice and rats. Lots of it. Immune response to Bt protein, allergenic. Bt corn causes anaphylactic shock, allergies. Leukemia, Journal of Hematology. And then there is what I call toxic proteins. Not necessarily that the proteins themselves are toxic directly. A lot of proteins are very toxic. We are surrounded by toxic proteins, all the venoms of, uh, of snakes and the venoms of spiders and all kinds of proteins are very toxic. It's not necessarily the case. Those proteins are not necessarily toxic directly. They can be, but by having affected their enzymatic activity, they are now affecting the end results of their processes so that their metabolic activity can result in toxic metabolics. Mice found fed Roundup soybean had damaged liver. Mice fed Roundup ready soy have damaged testicles, uterus, and ovaries. Rats fed engineered potatoes have damaged intestine and stomach. This was published in the most prestigious medical journal. This study has a bit of a history. This was the first alarm bell in 1999. 1999, 14 years ago, we have known for 14 years that this technology is not safe. And this last one here, this is the last one I'm going to show you. I could show you 200. Um, it's from last year, it's from a year ago. It's from a French lab. It's where I actually, I did my undergrad in Normandy in France, and this is from the same university. This team, um, <clears throat> okay, let me give you a bit of two minute history here. Monsanto wanted to commercialize their, their corn in Europe, and so Europe doesn't quite function as the same as uh, USA, and they said, you have to do studies. So Monsanto did a study feeding the rats for three months, uh, engineered grain. And uh, they did the analysis of the data, and they didn't see anything wrong, and they presented that to the European uh, Union, and everything was cool. And these researchers actually took the data. The data was not forthcoming. They had to, uh, to um, go to court, I think, to get it. They finally got the results of the studies, and they reanalyzed the study done by Monsanto, and found that actually the rats, after three months, were showing signs of toxicity. There were, there were significant differences between the treatments in the studies. And Monsanto and the regulatory agencies in Europe said, this is not biologically relevant. These researchers decided that this was biologically relevant, and they were going to repeat the study, and that's what they did. They repeated the study from Monsanto. But instead of doing it for three months, they did it for the whole time of the life of the rats, for two years. And they took blood samples from the mice and ra from the rats for every week, and etc. And after four months, they started finding symptoms. And after a year, there was a lot of breast cancer, and the rats started dying. And that's this study. And when this study came um, a year ago, well, the bubble, the scientists that are paid by Monsanto, by the chemical industry, just went like, 
ballistic. It's like, this study is not good. There's not enough data, there's not enough replications. This is the wrong strain of mice. You used a strain of mice that is very prone to cancer. They used the same strain of mice that Monsanto had used. And they were not trying to show cancer. They were trying to show what they had shown in their reanalysis of the data, kidney and liver damage. And they sure found kidney and liver damage after four months. And then cancer came. So what kind of future are we talking about? Because, because in the bubble here in North America, GMOs are the future. We need, we need engineered crops to feed the world. So we have Roundup, and this here is what I use. I, I gave a TED talk uh, six months ago. You can find it on YouTube if you want. And I use this to say there's a lot of dark clouds uh, with this technology. And Roundup, Roundup caused nutrient deficiencies because it is a chelating agent. It's competing with, with, the, with the cells. It's competing with the proteins. And the farmers know that. The farmers know very well that if they want to grow a genetic crop, they need to put a little bit of manganese with their fertilizer or maybe a little bit of cobalt or other micronutrients. There's definitely problems with Roundup as an antibiotic. Definitely problems with Roundup as a herbicide because it does bring super weeds and 2,4-D is going to do exactly the same thing. And then we have the engineered crops themselves, which have their own problems. The problem with yields, there is no increase in yield, there is no advantage. Definitely problems with contamination and more serious problem with genetic pollution. And then of course there's the problems with the allergenic proteins that are created and the toxic proteins that are created in the engineered crops. That's the end of my talk, but some people sometimes say, what can we do? And I, it's not my field, you know, I'm not an activist, I'm just a scientist, so I'm just going to give you a few of my own ideas, but if you think, oh, I forget. This here is a report, it's a document, it's 120 pages, it's a compilation of studies, of scientific studies, done by a genetic engineer in London, England, because he was, like me, I suppose, getting really tired of, of the bubble, and he compiled the literature showing that there was a lot of studies outside of the bubble that showed that actually engineered crops are not safe, or are, are toxic, etc., etc. This is called GMO Myth and Truth. It's available online for free. You can download it for free from um, a website called Earth Open Source. EarthOpenSource.org. It's for free. And what's really interesting with the document is that it was written, it was compiled by a genetic engineer, but it was written by a science writer. And she's really good, and it's really easy to read. It's basically for everybody. So if you want to learn a little bit more, if you're interested, you can download this and read at your leisure. So what can you do? Well, I mean, obviously, you want to avoid engineered food. So go organic, because organic today is basically the best way to avoid uh, engineered ingredients. You can also, if you, you know, don't go organic all the way, I don't, uh, you definitely make a point of not buying uh, processed food, prepared food, canned food from the store. Cook from scratch. You can Grow a garden if you want, grow your own food as much as you can, of course. Definitely organic, I recommend it. Save seeds. Six years ago, I became a seed saver. I joined a little association where I live with seed savers. 
And uh, it feels right. It feels right to see if seeds from my garden. I, I've become a gardener and I am called myself the chief weed puller where I live. And see if seeds, because it's very obvious that aside from what I said tonight about the safety of engineered foods or engineered crops, there is something about the chemical industry intent of basically taking over. And today, if you are a farmer and you are in a region where you're surrounded by uh, genetic engineered crops, genetic engineered farmers, uh, it's very difficult to find seeds that are not engineered. Remember, there's over 90% of corn and soy and canola and cotton that are engineered. There is no market for non-engineered seeds anymore. And it's a serious problem. There is, if, if these crops are all over the grocery stores, if you go to your grocery manager, this is not saving seeds, but if you go to your grocery manager and say, do you know about engineered food? And uh, you know, could you, could you get non-engineered food in this store? They'll say, I'll do my best, I'll try to source non-engineered ingredients, but you know, it's not easy. And the last one is, please make your voice heard. If you, you know, I don't know how you feel tonight, if you're surprised, if you're shocked, or perhaps you're angry, make your voice heard. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, talk to your municipal leaders, talk to your MP, MLA, etc., and tell them what you think. Because the change is not going to come from above. The change is going to come from you. And if you are angry, <laughs> let it rip. <laughs> and I'll just leave you with this last quote, because this is the end of my talk. I will be very happy to entertain all kinds of questions. None of the GE applications in agriculture today are valuable enough to farmers to make it reasonable to expose the environment, farmers and the people to even the slightest risk. Thank you.